Good afternoon and welcome to Building Public Health Advocacy Skills, an immunizations case study presented by the Iowa Public Health Association. My name is Janine Moody and I'm the IPHA Executive Director. It's my pleasure to welcome each of you to today's session. The Iowa Public Health Association would like to acknowledge the support and investment made by the Iowa Department of Public Health in IPHA's work related to promoting the public health practice of immunizations. Support for today's webinar is made possible through a service agreement between IDPH and IPHA. Due to the number of attendees on this webinar, all participant lines will be muted during the presentation. To submit a question for our presenters, please use the questions feature in your GoToWebinar control panel. We will monitor all submitted questions and pose them to our presenters during the question and answer portion of the webinar as time permits. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted along with presenter slides. The webinar will also be available to IPHA members via the IPHA webinar channel on the IPHA website. Member login is required to access the webinar channel. A few technical tips for to optimizing your webinar experience this afternoon. One, utilize a USB headset if available. Use a wired connection versus wireless if possible. And close any applications on your computer which require large bandwidth. For 93 years, the Iowa Public Health Association has been a trusted community of public health professionals and the collective voice for the health of Iowans. IPHA exists to unite and strengthen the voice for public health in Iowa. IPHA's core functions are to connect public health leaders, partners, and allies, to advance a public health agenda for Iowans through education and advocacy, and to directly serve our more than 600 members by providing education and curating resources. IPHA's strategic approach is to focus the network to be proactive on Iowa's public health core issues. Collectively, IPHA members are a force multiplier for advancing public health in Iowa and nationally, and in the past three years, IPHA has been recognized with three national awards for our advocacy work. We are pleased to have such a great response for today's webinar on advocacy skills and believe that using Iowa's recent experience around House File 7 provides a good case study for identifying best practices and educating the public health community on the role that they can play to advocate for sound public health policy. Now let's meet today's presenters. Heather Meadow is the Clinical Services Branch Supervisor at Lynn County Public Health. She's been extremely involved in helping to promote immunizations throughout the community and initiated vaccinating, vaccination projects such as infant cocooning at Unity Point St. Luke's Hospital and Mercy Medical Center in Cedar Rapids. She is the chair for the Lynn County Immunization Coalition and the chair of the board for the Iowa Immunization Coalition. The Lynn County Immunization Coalition has promoted HPV vaccinations over the past year with billboards, bus wraps, and producing educational brochure for the community. Since last year, the coalition in partnership with Lynn County Public Health have been offering HPV vaccinations at schools and colleges. Heather helps community partners with vaccination, education, and advocacy. Welcome, Heather. Krista Vandenbrink has worked at Winnesheet County Public Health for 20 years, with 15 of them as an administrator. Previously, she worked at St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester and a local DME store. She works with a variety of programs within the agency. She is a Stop the Bleed instructor. She serves as the president of the Iowa Alliance and Home Care Board of Directors and is a member of the Decorah Community School District's Board of Education. In pursuit of the work-life balance, she has one more year to chase her son on the cross-country circuit and the soccer field, pining for the picture that truly captures the moment. Krista also gets to enjoy some great barbecued meats prepared by her husband. She admits to binge-watching HGTV and has a short list of places she wants to visit. Welcome, Krista. Bethany Bjorklund is the immunization nurse for the Cerro Gordo County Department of Public Health. She's been the immunization nurse for Cerro Gordo since 2014 and previously managed the immunization program at Dickinson County Public Health. Prior to joining the great world of public health, Bethany began her nursing career specializing in medical intensive care at the University of Kansas Hospital. She received her bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of Iowa in 2008. Bethany was recognized by the Iowa Department of Public Health in 2013 as an immunization champion while employed at Dickinson County Public Health, and just this year was selected as the State of Iowa's 2018 CDC Childhood Immunization Champion. 
Bethany has also played a key role in Cerro Gordo County being ranked first in immunization coverage for two-year-olds by the Iowa Department of Public Health in 2016. Bethany is passionate about vaccines and firmly believes in their power to protect our citizens. Welcome, Bethany. And finally, Representative Michael Bergen is serving his first term in the Iowa House of Representatives. Representative Bergen serves as Vice Chairman of the Human Resources Committee and also serves on State Government, Ways and Means, and the Health and Human Services Sub-Appropriations Committees. His background serving on the Winnesheet County Board of Supervisors and as Area Director for Early Childhood Iowa and Decategorization Area in Howard, Alamakee, Winnesheet, and Clayton Counties has provided a good foundation for his role on these committees. He serves on two state boards, Early Childhood Iowa and the State Child Care Advisory Committee. He participates on the Allen Child Protection Center and Iowa Association for the Education of Young Children, Early Childhood Workforce Advisory Committee. Before I turn the presentation over to our guest, let's set the scene for today's case study. I think it's helpful for us to begin from a common definition of advocacy. Advocacy is arguing in favor of something such as a cause, an idea, or policy. One can engage in advocacy by meeting with a legislator on an important issue, writing an editorial for a newspaper, raising awareness for a cause at a community event, or even promoting an issue while having dinner with friends. We advocate when we engage in dialogue about an issue we care about. It can occur in many forms, speaking out, letter writing, protesting, voting, and even wearing a t-shirt that makes a statement. This is clearly a shameless plug for you to buy a t-shirt from my PHA, and I'm happy to talk to you about that after the webinar. So why is advocacy important to public health? Advocacy is a central tenet of public health. And effective ad public health advocacy offers solutions that are evidence-based. Let's use a story to illustrate some of the original advocacy on behalf of public health. Dr. John Snow was a British physician who theorized that cholera, a deadly disease, was spread when people drank contaminated water. Lacking modern plumbing, Londoners dumped sewage into the river or into cesspools near town wells contaminating the water supply, leading to a rapid spread of disease. In 1854, a mother washed her baby's diapers in a town well and touched off an epidemic that killed 616 people. Dr. Snow presented meticulous data supporting his then controversial theory that most deceased persons had lived near and had drunk water from the pump. The pump handle was removed nine days after the initial outbreak, a community action that prevented additional cholera deaths. The that was public health advocacy. Without advocacy, we wouldn't have seatbelt laws, smoke-free workplaces, or nutrition labeling. Advocacy is vital in advancing public health to keep our communities healthy and safe. If public health stakeholders don't speak up and advocate for public, important public health issues, opposing side wills. Will, without the voice of those who possess both expertise and experience in public health, legislation, regulations, and other policy decisions may not reflect what is best for the public's health. Now let's move into our case study. At the start of the 2017 Iowa legislative session, then Representative Ken Reiser introduced House File 7, referred to as the personal exemption bill. Representative Reiser was representing House District 68, which covers a portion of Lynn County, Iowa. What would the bill do? Section 139A.8 of Iowa Code addresses childhood immunizations and the requirement that Iowa children shall not enroll in elementary or secondary school or licensed child care centers without evidence of adequate immunization for a specified list of vaccine preventable diseases. The section does provide two options for exemption from the required immunizations by which a minor or their parent or legal guardian may submit to the school or child care center either A, a statement signed by a health care provider indicating the immunizations required would be injurious to the health and well-being of the applicant or to any member of the applicant's family. This is often called the medical exemption or B, a signed affidavit stating that the immunization conflicts with the tenets and practices of a recognized religious denomination of which the applicant is an adherent or member. The bill was introduced by Representative Reiser on January 17th and referred to the House Human Resources Committee. 
It was assigned to a subcommittee of the HR committee comprised of Representative Stephen Holt of District 18. And District 18 covers portions of Harrison, Cass, Shelby, and Crawford counties. Also on the subcommittee was Representative Sandy Salmon of District 63, which includes Bramer County and part of Blackhawk County. And also Representative Beth Wessel Crochelle, um, which in Beth um, Wessel Crochelle covers, her district covers a portion of Story County, more of the rural area of Story County. The subcommittee held a hearing on January 26, so it moved pretty quickly. And the subcommittee approved passage to the full Human Resources Committee. Ultimately, House File 7 never advanced because it was defeated within the Republican Caucus, the party that was in power at the time. Those are the facts, but it's important to understand what took place in terms of context and public health advocacy. So some context for you. In some ways, immunizations are a victim of their own success, which makes them easily politicized. Not unlike other public health issues on which IPHA has been advocating for several years, such as the movement to legalize the sale of raw or unpasteurized milk, or to discontinue the practice of community water fluoridation, these issues are what I refer to as a collective generational amnesia around public health practice. In other words, for generations, our society has not experienced major outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases that previously routinely sickened and even killed our children. This has created a lack of, of collective appreciation for the public health impact of immunization. Only 19 states allow philosophical exemptions such as House File 7 would have created, but they vary by type across the states. And these states are more susceptible to outbreaks. I won't get too much into the clinical detail of the practice of immunizations. Obviously, we have several people on this webinar who are far more um, experienced and have greater expertise on immunizations, so we'll save that for our presenters. But I do want to sh share that for many in the public health and the healthcare community and providers, House File 7 signaled a turning point in which science-informed, evidence-based policy was clearly not compelling to some policymakers. Science alone does not always win the day, and our strategies to educate and inform on policy need to acknowledge this reality. So what action did IPHA take? We contacted the full Human Resources Committee and House leadership to indicate opposition to the bill. We backed this with evidence on the public health impact of childhood immunization. We presented testimony along with numerous other partners from the governmental public health sector and private provider community at the hearing. We issued an action alert to the IPHA membership, including a call to action and key talking points, which were provided courtesy of the Iowa Department of Public Health. And we contacted other partners, encouraging them to make use of our action alert and resources that we had compiled. I hope that this background serves to set the stage for our presenters today. We will now hear examples of how public health providers responded to House File 7 and then have a legislator's perspective on how policymakers make decisions, what the discussion was around House File 7, and how public health practitioners can be a useful resource to policymakers. We'll now turn things over to Heather. So Heather, let's check your audio. Yeah, I hope everybody can hear me. I can hear you just fine. And okay, we'll wonderful. Slides. Great. Well, again, my name is Heather Metter, and I am from Lynn County Public Health here in the Cedar Rapids area. Um, so I want to thank um, Janine for asking me to, to speak today. So and I want to talk a little bit about the Lynn County response um, when House File 7 was first introduced. So as a governmental agency, uh, we cannot do any lobbying. As employees of a, of a county government, we're not able to lobby, but we are able to advocate. Um, and so we really um, were surprised by House File 7, and we really started to, um, to hear all kinds of rumors and rumblings that this was occurring. So uh, I don't know if, can everybody see, I, Janine, can you see my no. screen? Heather, I couldn't see that you were sharing your screen, so I've taken control okay. back and I can show okay. your screen. How about Perfect. That? Okay. okay. Wonderful. So, um, so we started to hear rumors about um, House File 7, and we weren't sure exactly what was going on. So the first thing we wanted to do is make sure that we had the facts and that we had all the correct information. 
So initially, um, when we started to hear rumblings about House File 7, we did reach out to our contacts, Don and Bethany, at the Iowa Department of Public Health, to get more information from them of what they've heard, um, what has been going through um, the department. And part of that is, one, we want the facts, but two, we also want to make sure our messaging is going to align with the Iowa Department of Public Health. We also reached out to Deborah Thompson at the at IPHA to find out more information from her. Um, this is when we first learned um, that Representative Riser, who was from Lynn County, um, was introducing House File 7. And so um, Deborah was also able to give us more information um, with her conversations with Representative Riser that he wasn't opposed to vaccinations. Um, he actually thinks that they're a good thing, that his issue was that he thought individuals should have the right to choose to be vaccinated. It shouldn't be mandated. Um, so that was good information for us, too, because it was important for us to know where was this coming from and just what the stance was. So really, initially, before anything was going to happen, we really needed to make sure that we had all the facts and that we weren't addressing anything that was incorrect. Um, if we're going to do any advocacy, we really need to make sure that we have all the correct data before we really reached out. So once we had all of those facts and we knew exactly what was going on, where people stood, we started to find champions. And, and this is important too. Um, because as a health department, even though Lynn County is the um, second largest community in the state of Iowa, we're still a small department. We can't do this all on our own. So we really need to find champions within our area uh, to help us out um, and to get our messaging and to help advocate with us. So we really initiated um, the help of a lot of different groups. Um, I am chair of the Lynn County Immunization Coalition. But again, I did not want it to look like Lynn County was doing any kind of um, lobbying. So um, I worked with our exec board on the immunization to make sure that they had all that information correct and so that the president and vice president um, would be the face of any information that was disseminated out into our community. We also reached out to our school nurses, our public school nurses, parochial school nurses. We reached out to our community college and our local colleges to make sure that they were aware of House File 7 and to get their support. Um, we reached out to our physicians, our nurse practitioners, and our PAs in our area so that they would also be aware of House File 7 and what that would mean. And then we work together um, to really arm our champions with the information that they needed so that they could do advocacy. So at the health department, we hunted down information regarding personal belief exemptions in other states. We looked for letters that had been used in other states that opposed personal belief exemptions. We looked for studies that indicated geographic areas in the United States with the higher rates of immunization exemptions and that were more likely to have vaccine preventable disease outbreaks. We looked for evidence that states with philosophical exemptions have seen a decrease in, in, immun in immunization rates. And we looked for information on current and recent outbreaks. And we also tried to get what the financial impact of an outbreak would be on a family and on the community. And then we worked with our champions on personal stories. Because like Janine had mentioned before, anymore it doesn't seem to matter how many facts we have. It seems like people are moved more by emotion. And so we needed to use that emotion in our messaging too. And some of our best champions were our physicians in the area. Um, we had physicians calling our local representatives, including Dr. Reiser, and telling stories of the children that they have seen in the past that they've treated uh, for these vaccine-preventable diseases. They told stories of the children that did not survive due to vaccine-preventable diseases. 
they really went back in history and talked a lot about what they used to see and the difference that immunizations have made. We, they were able then to also discuss how places that don't have good immunization rates have seen a recurrence of these diseases and what that would mean. So we really tried to go after the emotion. The other thing is we took this information and we armed our champions with as much as they can. So if anybody went after them with incorrect information, incorrect data or facts that they're finding on social media, that they had the correct information and that they could counter those arguments. We also knew that we could not lobby, but that we could help our friends that may want to lobby. So we would help them if they needed help crafting letters or informational pieces that would be sent out. We help to provide data and statistics to these entities. We help to review material prior to distribution to make sure that it was accurate and that it was correct. But the whole time, we did make sure that Lynn County, our logos, and that our name was not mentioned in any of the material because we did not want to appear that we were doing any type of lobbying, but that we were just there to help advocate. And we worked really hard to make sure that all of our champions in this area, that we all had a consistent message. So no matter where you heard this message or if you heard it from multiple entities, that the message was always the same. It was consistent. We worked really hard to make sure it was factual. We wanted to make sure that we didn't have anything that um, may lead to more controversy, but we wanted to keep our facts straight. And then we really worked with our champions on those motivational stories to make sure that whenever they were discussing um, immunizations with someone, that there was some type of story that they could share. So what you see on your screen now is just part of a letter um, that our immunization coalition sent out to members. And part of this letter came from the Iowa School Nurse Organization. They were very quick to respond. And so we worked with them a lot too. Um, again, using a lot of the same information and using um, bits and pieces right out of their own letter so that again, anything that was going out, it was consistent messaging. So no matter what you were hearing, it was always consistent. So um, through all of this, we did have some, some great responses. Um, the community stayed in touch with each other. And again, our, some of our providers, our physicians, were some of our best champions and really um, got on the phone and were making lots of phone calls, talking to their pa uh, patients, and really just very outspoken um, when House File 7 was first introduced. So thank you. Thank you, Heather. Appreciate that. And so now we'll move on to Bethany. Bethany Dorkland from Cerro Gordo. Bethany, can we check your audio? Hello, this is Bethany. Great, and I'm going to give control of the screen over to you. Okay. All righty. Are we able to see that? Cerro Gordo County Department of Public Health? Okay. Um, not yet. Can you try that again? It's up on my screen right now. Okay, then you know what? I will just make myself the presenter and show your slides. So you go ahead and move forward. Okay. You just let me know. Are they showing now? Just one moment. Sure. Um, there we go. go All ahead. right. Okay. Well, thank you for coming and joining today. I'm Bethany Bjorkland, immunization nurse for the Sarah County Department of Public Health. That's my contact information. Um, I'm going to have Janine go to the next slide here. Um, now, um, for House File 7, what we did here for our advocacy is we... Um, kind of did um, several different avenues at the same time, you know, and keeping in mind us as an organization, you know, uh, lobbying versus the advocacy. So this is what we did, is we sent letters to our representatives who are in our area. They included statistics on children with exemptions and the increase in incidence, in particular to measles and pertussis. Um, those with um, personal exemptions, you know, can be over 20 times more likely to get the measles. And so I felt like that was a super powerful um, quote or data that um, 
our representatives just kind of needed to understand that that's important to know. And some other things is what can we do to protect those unable to receive the vaccines? And like how they're really put it, um, you know, there's children that are too young, children are medically exempted. I mean, we have children who attend our schools and daycares who medically cannot receive certain vaccines, especially in particular measles, the vaccine. And so we really wanted to continue to emphasize that importance is we need to protect those children. Also is the economic and psychosocial burden of these vaccine preventable diseases in our community is, you know, and I also put a bullet is who will pay for the disease outbreak investigation. And we're trying not to look at it in terms of that, but we are so thankful, knock on wood and blessed that uh, we are able to devote our time continuing to prevent these diseases instead of responding and reacting and that's how public health i feel works best is preventing it before we have that and like heather had mentioned as well the psychosocial burden is if a child is diagnosed with measles they you know as declared by our department of public health they might be quarantined for up to 21 plus days and those around them and so we have to act fast as a disease like that can spread very quickly and we need to make sure we protect the public's health. And so those are just some things to think about as um, this uh, bill kind of went to that Human Resources Committee. We also information shared with our major medical partners, including Mercy Medical Center, North Iowa, our school nurses and other local public health in our area up here in North Iowa to kind of help them out and encourage them please contact please speak and like heather said share your stories you know tell them about your patients and experiences we also had an opportunity to um were asked to take part in a camty news three story um, um the following monday after we kind of started our letters and talk about they actually had a citizen talk about why they felt like house file seven allowing those philosophical exemptions was of you know, benefit to her. And um, I was very thankful and glad that they took a quote from us in regards to the increase in incidence of vaccine preventable diseases of those who are exempted. Um, so I feel like hopefully that helps kind of get true and, and accurate information out there in our community. Uh, we also outreach to other immunization advocates. Um, you know, like people on Facebook, I follow Dr. Pan in um, California and they were able to um, eliminate their philosophical exemption. So it's a small world. They respond to your messages and just say, you know, ask them, what can we do? And one of the biggest things and like Lane County did is you, you have to make it real. You got to share these personal stories about the effects of these vaccine preventable diseases. And um, we also attended Public Health Day on the Hill. Our health director had met um, in our region. We have um, the Speaker of the House, Linda Upmeyer. And so um, our health director was able to meet one-on-one uh, -on -one with her the next day. Um, next slide. So lessons learned is turnaround time is fast. I, um, I mean, I've been in public health for six years, but um, it was definitely a learning curve, learning opportunity for me. Um, I believe we received our notification on the Friday, the January 27th. We had those letters and provider outreach completed the same day, encouraging them to outreach and share their stories. Um, and then that media story I talked about aired that Monday evening, January 30th. So definitely turnaround time was pretty fast. And public health down the hill, I believe, was that Wednesday following. So we were able to hopefully get a lot of good, accurate information out there timely. And uh, another thing I really tend to stick to is try not to reinvent, reinvent the wheel moving forward. Um, Iowa Public Health Association and Iowa Department of Public Health did have some wonderful templates, resources available. I definitely have them saved on my computer. Um, I've saved the resources we have. And um, even just listening to this webinar, even just after Heather, um, is just wonderful for me as well. Um, advocacy versus lobbying, continuing to learn where that limit is. And uh, Representative Bergen, I'm sure, can maybe emphasize a little bit more in regards to that, if there's anything there. Um, and I want you to know, or this is what I'm thinking is, we need to anticipate this topic to continue with each session, whether or not it's philosophical exemptions, or I'm not saying anything, but maybe eliminating religious exemption, you know in the news and nationally, this is continuing to be um, a factor in important um, public health 
in each state. And so we need to know how can we continue these conversations with our, our representatives, whether it's allowing a personal or philosophical exemption and the religious, we need to let them know, you know, why is this important and to make sure the public's health is protected. Um, also address these communications from our Board of Health. That's something we're thinking about, um, you know, moving forward is letting our Board of Health kind of be a little bit more of a voice. So that's something we've kind of learned and maybe looking into. Um, I gained a better understanding on Iowa's governmental process and structure. Um, I took a 12th grade government class, but uh, this is definitely good for me to know. There's, there's a little bit more out there than what I learned then. And um, times have changed. And for the, any agency who are looking into getting FAB accredited, public health accreditation, um, we were able to, um, domain six of that, it has to do with policy, and we were able to meet a standard um, due to this. And so we didn't do this just to meet a FAB, but it really goes along with, um, you know, what we should be doing as public health and the things we can do to continue to promote uh, vaccines. So, um, that's all I have today. Um, thank you so much. And there's my information. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, an opportunity like this is wonderful. We can continue to uh, strengthen our public health um, team work here in the state of Iowa. So thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Bethany. Appreciate your sharing. And we'll now turn it over to Krista Vandenbrink. Krista, third time's a charm. Let's see if we can see your screen. Hey, there we go. Okay, and Krista, um, let's check your audio. Okay, Krista, not hearing you, so that's a challenge. Um, we were working before, so let's see. It says that you still need to enter your audio pin, pound four two, pound. We must have lost that capability. I know we checked your audio before we started here and everything was fine. Okay, Krista, can you check again, see maybe if on your computer or on your phone line, if you've muted yourself? Okay, well, that's really frustrating. I'm sorry, because I definitely want to hear your presentation. So let's maybe do this. Let's go ahead and um, move on to Representative Bergen, if we can. And Krista, we will try to resolve that issue and circle back to you. I know that's a, a little bit out of sequence from what we were planning to do, but let's give that a go. So Representative Bergen, um, let's check your audio. Yeah. There you are. Okay, I'm going to make you the presenter, and you can show your slides now. Okay. That sounds good. All right, thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, briefly run through some advocacy versus lobbying perspectives. Um, everyone should have a relationship with their own representative and senator, and that's who's on your ballot. And it's based on your home address. And even if you work in a neighboring county uh, you, that has a different representative, you want to have that relationship with your representative. Um, that's constituency. Um, and, and an advocacy relationship is very appropriate. Um, if you're talking with a, a representative that you do not vote for, uh, there are situa many situations where that would be considered lobbying. Um, a couple of what I would perceive general accepted exceptions would be if you have a professional role as uh, director of public health in, in Winnesha County, for example, uh, you'd make contact with who represents the county. Uh, in Winnishik has two representatives and, and uh, two senators that uh, are impacted, um, and it would be very appropriate in your role to establish some relationships there. And then also in a service area, if your county contracts out and, and, and provides a particular service uh, in multiple counties, um, I think it's generally accepted that um, with through that service area that a reasonable contact would um, be involved. And then it would probably be a matter of uh, what, you know, scope of discussion uh, that you would have from there going forward. Um, you want to make contact in your home district outside of the legislative session. Um, 
we are overwhelmed with the activities during our, our four months, there's 100 days, 110 days of session. Uh, and it's important to take this opportunity uh, during the off year or as an election year, you might work to have contact with uh, candidates uh, for office uh, even before the election. Because once the election takes place, it's six short weeks before we um, are looking at, at session. Uh, and then it, that becomes a hectic time as well. Uh, I uh, consider it a success for your advocacy if you're in my contact book. If I've, if I've got your phone number, your cell phone, um, address, information, and email uh, on my cell phone, then we have an established relationship. It's helpful for me as a representative because when issues come up that a lobbyist is bringing forward, if I haven't heard about this at home, it's not an issue or it's not a problem. It doesn't, it doesn't raise a high level of alertness or impact. But if I'm hearing from locally that it's an issue, then I can follow up with the association lobbyist to confirm situations, or I can directly contact my local public health advocate uh, to find out more information. In my mind, it'd be helpful that when you establish that relationship that you identify three to five topics that you can put on one page. These are some specific areas that we have concerns in state legislation from year to year, um, and then provide maybe some additional summary or resources, but by and large, be a con establish that contact and be a resource. Look to your local Board of Health members uh, to be resources as well. I would encourage each county to have one or two of their members establish similar relationships to help reinforce uh, the director's position. And, and oftentimes you might have a veterinarian or a physician uh, and, and they're excellent resources. When you look at public health, some of our, our areas are in the agricultural environment uh, and those impacts can be helpful to reinforce. When you look at lobbying, lobbying involves a registration and reporting process. Uh, there's a significant, significant ethical uh, practices that need to be adhered to. Uh, there can be fines and other things associated. And that's what the association's role is. Uh, during the session, they're active, but year round as well. Um, and so as uh, a local individual, it's important to know the association's position. You wanna be a resource for your association. Similarly, uh, when an, the bill comes out, there's a call to action. Uh, they ask you to contact the uh, representatives. Your activities of being a resource of, of contacting your local representative, having a discussion about the bill, and then reporting back so that the, uh, the lobbyist on capital and, and on site as things are going on can, can have feedback. Uh, and as as feasible, participate in your uh, day at the Capitol uh, and uh, have some interaction. Uh, I want to just also point out, if you have contact with uh, a representative center from a different part of the state, uh, by all means, uh, have that conversation, uh, you know, do the introduction, tell them where you're from, and offer to be a resource. If they ask you questions or information, that you can easily respond. But if you start dumping on them, um, that's not always well received. Uh, but certainly some issues come up uh, parochially or in, in certain sectors of the state. We have an obligation on a statewide basis. If I need information on what's going down in Henry County or Washington County over a health issue, I may want to be reaching out to them as well. When we look at targeting our advocacy, um, and if it's a house bill that comes out, you know, maybe don't spend so much time on the Senate. It may get there, it may not get there. Uh, it's, we, we've got a lot on our plate. I know I was contacted by many, many Senate bills that wouldn't even get out of the starting gate, but they raised a lot of uh, concern um, locally and across the state. And so there's a lot of issues, but be mindful of that. If the House bill, contact the House, unless it's already passed the House and then gone on over to the Senate. Um, Look at the committee that's assigned so that you can focus on the on the committee members. The association does that at the at the kit. They may ask you, they may ask uh, Krista to contact 
Representative Bergen, because he's on the Human Resources Committee, um, get his feel for it, report back to us, see what can happen. Uh, there's a, typically a three or five member subcommittee assignment that's really gonna work through some of the details. Um, look at the, move that on to later to uh, committee consideration and if it passes out of committee to floor action. Each of those areas are opportunities to make some changes to the legislation or, or potentially defeat it. But the subcommittee arena is the most effective. Uh, but that's a short time frame, short window up front uh, to be involved. Um, look at bill sponsorship. There's individually sponsored bills. This was individually sponsored by Representative Riser. He wasn't a member of the committee hearing it. Uh, he was bringing it forward. They tend to be a little weaker um, on the process getting through. Typically, a policy bill takes three years to get through the legislature. So not every bill is just going to uh, funnel right through to, to the end. Um, bills that have multiple sponsors probably have a little more uh, weight behind them. They've got a, a broader base of, of buy-in. Um, and then there are com committee-sponsored bills. Uh, committee-sponsored bills are the most likely to be passed through the committee and through the floor during this session, uh, at least through, through one house. Um, and so if there's concerns in a committee bill, uh, in my mind, that's where you should be spending significant energy. When we look at bills, we look at the reg registration by lobbyists. So if you pull out House File 7, we have a, there's three pages or so of, of lobbyist registration. 80% um, of them are against and a few are undecided. No one was for it. Um, so when you look at that, that's a place where you can identify allies. Um, the associations do it at the capital level. You in a local area can, can look up and say, oh, the hospital association registered against it. I'm going to contact my local hospital, get some feedback there. Uh, if there's something from the schools or education, look to see what contingencies are there to help identify uh, allies. Um, know what your outcomes are. I mean, oftentimes you just want to kill the bill. Uh, surprisingly, that isn't so easy to do. Uh, and uh, you really need to be looking at uh, your fallback positions or a backup position and negotiate on modifying the bill. Uh, working through to find something that's acceptable. Um, in this bill, it was overwhelming uh, registration against. Uh, there was some a real process around killing a bill. Sometimes your efforts are around passing a bill, and that is building coalitions uh, and and passing perhaps with modification, where where you're working with some of those that are registered against to find some middle ground where they can at least move to a uh, undecided uh, registration. In your contact with your legislator, always be polite. Have your emails containing some sort of subject matter, bill number. Uh, it's not uncommon to get 400 emails a day. Uh, 150 is, is kind of the minimum. Um, and when you're pressed for time, having some information, having a, your name, address, and phone number are important. If, if it's a constitu constituent that I know that lives in my district, um, I'm highly likely to respond to it. Um, if it's something that's an email that's coming from someone in um, Iowa City or Red Oak, Iowa, uh, typically I'll read it or read enough of it to know. Sometimes they're um, copycat emails, uh, you know, to recognize it's there. But I do not take time to respond to someone who I know is not a constituent uh, unless I have an established relationship. Uh, and then uh, I personally identify, personally characterize your emails. If the association sends out, here's, here's our concern, uh, just don't do a copycat uh, email that goes out to everyone, and I might get eight or 10 of them uh, from various constituents or, or, or other advocates. Um, personalize it, get something that, that's meaningful uh, directly from you. And then if you want a response or need a response, oftentimes we're getting emails that are just, here's the point, um, they didn't really care to get a response, or if I, even sometimes I respond, they're surprised that I took time to respond. Um, but certainly if you want a response or, or need that, uh, put that in the message. Um, shorter is better than longer. Um, sometimes it's a short message with an attachment. Uh, if I have time, then I can explore further. 
uh, but I have a summary up front. When we look at the vaccine issue, by and large, this is something that personal experience bias is, is at the forefront. What's my background? What's my experience? Uh, I had the mumps. I had chicken pox. I did not have measles. Uh, you know, in, just in the, in the mix of things, some of the vaccinations uh, were, were coming in. You know, I didn't have to deal with polio and some of the other uh, things that we fortunately had significant impacts through successes through our vaccines. Um, uh, there's a couple things. Uh, I had my own daughter's experience with chicken pox. She got chicken pox about a week after they came out with their chicken pox vaccine. Um, I'm a big advocate of chicken pox vaccine. My daughter had significant uh, reactions and secondary infections and uh, um, some real challenges. And if we can uh, not have to go through that, I think we're all better off. Uh, as a young child, I had to... Uh, would listen to my grandfather tell the story. He was four or five years old. The family was quarantined uh, in their small home. Uh, they passed the body of his younger sister through the window in a peach box uh, for the relatives to bury in the cemetery. Uh, and she died from diphtheria. Uh, that's something that uh, significantly impacted her, the, his mother and her mental health uh, throughout the remainder of his, her life. Uh, and, uh, you know, just uh, something that we're not accustomed to, a quarantine process. Uh, and I think people, they might want some libertarian choice ideals, and quarantine is not one that they want. So we need to find some balance. Um, and so when you're contact with your representative, help determine, help your association determine where they stand and, and for what reasons that they stand. You know, look at your scientific studies and your evidence. Um, examine the common uh, perceptions and myths. I've had experience in early childhood Iowa. One of my roles was how do we increase the number of vaccines that, uh, for children age two? Uh, how do we increase vaccines for children going into child care environments, into the school system, getting those updates? And so I've been active in a local area of, of keeping people involved. The other aspect about being a legislature, le legislator is we look at uh, w what's our role. Do we look at the public opinion poll in, in our area and do we vote with the poll? Um, and, and my answer is no. I learned from a state senator back when I was in high school. Uh, the, his approach, which I've adopted, is I'm elected to represent people in my area, which is parochial, but I also have a role on a statewide basis. And as that elected official, it's my obligation to become educated and make an educated, informed decision on, on really complex questions that uh, uh, one sentence, are you for or against, poll isn't going to answer, uh, that, that the general populace just doesn't have uh, enough information themselves in that polling question or, uh, to, to respond. And uh, that's my brief summary at this point. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Representative Bergen. That was a lot of candid insight and experience gained from um, and shared with us. We appreciate that. We are going to give it another go here with Krista. Um, Krista, let's check your audio. Hi there. This is Krista. Yay! It's Krista. Okay, great. All right, so I'm going to make you the presenter and hand you over and we'll look at your slides. All right. Thanks Hopefully for hanging in there, Krista. Hopefully you can see my slides, um, and if not, yes, they, they should be coming through very mm -hmm. quickly. Um, okay, but it's not advancing. There we go. So, when I first heard about House File 7, it was on my local radio station on the 6 o'clock news in the morning. And I wasn't sure that I had heard that whole story. So, I, I was really wondering, hmm, I think I need to listen to that again. Unfortunately, my local news gets replayed on the hour. So at seven o'clock, I listened. And then I was thinking, you've got to be kidding me. I did hear that whole story. And then I was thinking, again, what are they thinking in Des Moines? And of course, being the public health people that we are, one of the first things that we have always found that we need to do 
especially when we're investigating communicable diseases, is really to clarify and verify or to validate where is this information coming from. And so one of the tools that we have accessible to us is the legislative website. And you can see the link there on your screen. And that particular website has a lot of different resources for all of us to use. Um, the different legislators that are in your area, their committee assignments, the status of a bill, you can track all of that. Um, there really is a lot of information on that website, but I will tell you that that can be kind of intimidating and a little daunting, especially if you've never gone to that website before. So now that session isn't in session, um, this would probably be a good time for you to go ahead, check out that website, find your legislators, find their contact information. It's just a good check-in so that you can see what all is available on that different website. Um, keep in mind that this is an election year, and so some of those committee assignments, as uh, Representative Bergen talked about, some of them will be reassigned, and there are some positions that are going to be open yet, yet waiting to be assigned, and we'll know more about that um, you know, after the elections and there into January. So the other thing that we did was also contact with IDPH. Um, I had a couple of unique things that had happened to me. Um, I had heard Deborah Thompson, who was the advocacy person at IDPH at one of our public health contractors meeting, and I was also one of those people that was subscribed to the legislative updates that she regularly would send out. And I purposely contacted her because I wanted to know if she had heard any rumblings at the house about this particular um, file that was coming up. And she was able to share a lot of information with me. Um, some talking points from her angle, um, just some information really as a background, which I did go ahead and utilize some of that information when I sent out letters. The other person I contacted at IDPH was Holly Carver Kim, who was PIO person. I had received um, a phone call from a radio station up in La Crosse, which is about 50 miles away. Um, keep in mind that there's 99 counties in Iowa and they chose to call me. And so um, they wanted a comment about House File 7. So this goes to show that information really spreads very quickly, um, whether or not you think you're just in Iowa and isolated or it's nationwide. Um, I didn't want to give out just a Winnesheet County response. I wanted to make sure it was truly a state response. And so I had referred them to Polly Carver Kim and she actually forwarded me the response that she had given to the radio station. Um, and she was more than happy to talk to them. So don't feel like you have to take it all on your shoulders yourself. Go ahead and utilize some of the resources that we have. And um, IDPH is a great resource for us. Well, once I have that information, I wanted to make sure that other people were notified. Obviously, our Board of Health. Our Board of Health is a very active and progressive board. Um, they're known at the, at the state level really for being a flagship for a lot of um, agencies in the state of Iowa. And so the Board of Health actually chose to take a look at some of the information and I shared with them the information that I had received and they uh, crafted their own letter. Uh, they actually sent that letter to Representative Bergen. Uh, granted, they believe it was after the fact, after the vote, but it didn't matter. We still wanted to make sure that the board was um, being representative um, and that Representative Bergen knew the board's stance on it. I also made sure that not just our staff, but particularly our nurses knew about this particular house file. Uh, I did have a couple of nurses who went ahead and wrote letters. Um, but here's the thing. They all say, well, but you write it better. I just sound dumb when I read it. I don't know what to say. I'll talk more about that in a little bit, um, but I'm gonna say everybody can do this. The other thing that I did was to contact my regional public health administrators. So I'm in region two, and when I sent an email out to the regional administrators, I had a mixed response back. I had some individuals who indicated that they had no clue that this was happening but I also had a nice handful that said, hey, I do know about this and here's what we're doing. So it was, it's interesting to note that not everybody is going to know what everybody's doing, 
So sometimes it's good to go ahead and share the information that you have really with those partners. And our other presenters have talked about that before. Even if you're in the same line of work, so to say, go ahead and share that information. I would rather have it actually in my inbox a couple of times than not at all. So as I talked about, we drafted a letter. The Board of Health drafted the letter. Theirs was separate than mine. I drafted the letter and I really talked about my concerns as a nurse particularly as a public health nurse, but also as a citizen. And I wanted to emphasize the fact that this was gonna negatively impact a whole lot of people. And I did use, like I said, the talking points, the, st the statistics and some of the facts that IDPH had shared with me. And again, that was through Polly Carver Kim and through Deborah Thompson at the time. And it was really nice that they just had basically a file that they were ready to share with me. Um, and so, again, our previous presenters have talked about having this information readily available. I highly recommend it. It's a good thing to do. Um, you'll notice on my last point here, I say just write. Remember, I talked about the fact that there's a lot of people that think that they can't do this. They just, they don't know how to converse with a legislator and they don't know the right words to use. I'm here to tell you that um, we all use copy paste and we all use cut and delete a lot, um, it's okay. Go ahead and just write it out and then go back and erase it and figure out, oh, that's not what I want to say. This is what I want to say. It's all right to do that. You don't have to have necessarily all of the information, but what we've done is to give you some resources where you can get some of those bits of information and then you can put them together so that it's coming from you. You are the person that's writing it. Um, it's, it's really important just to communicate the message to your legislator as well as to other folks. So what I did is I shared it with my representative, which is Representative Bergen. I did share my letter with IDPH and IPHA to let them know what I had sent out. I also shared it with a lot of other partners. So they were representatives from other agencies. Um, did share it with a couple of other representatives surrounding our area as well as a couple of people in the committees. Um, it was interesting to note because I did get responses. Um, I was kind of surprised, right? But I did get responses. Um, in fact, Representative Bergen actually called me and said, yep, I'm with you on this one. Um, but other people had said, hey, you know what? We have to make sure that they vote no on this one. Um, and then I compiled all of that information and shared that with IDPH and IPHA too, just so that they kind of knew that this was hopefully going to come together. But when Representative Bergen had called me, I know I asked him, where is, where is he coming from with this? What's his motive? And that was really good to know because the legislators do get to know each other down there. They also um, go ahead and get to learn each other's personalities. So although he wasn't maybe able to share that with me, that was okay. Um, but they get to work with each other, and so they develop some of those relationships. So that's always important. The other thing that we all forget to do, and I, I do mention this as a forgotten item, is we do need to pay attention to the bill. So just because we write the letter doesn't mean that it should be off of our plate. We can cross that off our to-do list for the day. Pay attention to that status. What's happening with that bill? Did it pass? Did it fail? Is it still in committee? Um, you know, has it stalled? What's going on? but ultimately thank your legislators for their vote, especially if it turns out the way that you want it to, but if it doesn't, try to contact your legislator and find out what's happening, what changed, what's, what's happening, what's, what's going on with this. Um, go ahead and ask those questions. There's nothing wrong with that. Your legislator may not be able to tell you the full answer because they may not know themselves, um, but they can get you some information. So it's being that resource, like um, Mike has said in the past. So now, because session is not going on, it's the time to get to know your current legislator or those who are running for office. Um, because truly making those conditions, connections are key. Um, when situations arise and, and uh, your legislator wants questions answered, you want to be that public health expert or the expert in in your subject matter, you want to be the person that they call. 
And again, go ahead and reach out. There's sometimes some town hall meetings, there's get to know, um, meet and greet types of things. Go ahead and attend those. It's important to make those connections. And like I said, you want to be the subject matter, you want to be the person that they go ahead and call. So make sure that you have your business cards with you and hand them out readily. All right, Janine. Okay, Krista, thanks so much. And thanks for being a good sport uh, about hanging on while we fix your audio. Um, so I did a quick impromptu poll and asked our attendees if they're willing to hang on a little bit long because we are going a little bit long here today. Lots of good information to share. And the vast majority of people said, yes, I can hang on and I want more um, presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and move into the uh, skills part of our webinar. Is, and I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna shortchange it, I'll be honest, a bit. Um, but just wanna put that out there and say, anybody is at any time, welcome to contact IPHA um, and be a part of what we're doing and happy to answer further questions. But I will just kind of cruise through this next part of the webinar so we have a little bit of time for questions and answers, which reminds me, um, please use your question answer, your question feature on your go-to webinar control panel to type in any questions that you have for our presenters. Um, so this slide here just gives you a quick highlight of some of the key advocacy events um, that IPHA participates in the year during the course of the year um, both at the state level and at the federal level um, our 2018 public health action campaign in which we engage all of Iowa's congressional delegation on federal public health issues will be kicking off um, in mid-July and into August so look for that also um, I just have to share that advocacy takes a village and so this is just a like super off the top of my head quick listing of different organizations that the Iowa Public Health Association um, partners with on our advocacy work and you heard from the presentations earlier today that um, none of this happens in a vacuum and we all need to collaborate and share resources as we can. Also then a little bit about lobbying versus advocacy. So advocacy entails the processes by which the actions of individuals or groups attempt to bring about social and or organization change on behalf of a particular health goal, program, interest, or population. Health advocacy includes educating policymakers and the public about evidence-based policy. On the other hand, lobbying, and, and this is the real concern, is what's lobbying and what's advocacy? Lobbying attempts to influence a legislative body through communication with a member or employee of a legislative body or with a government official who participates in formulating legislation. Lobbying can include written and oral communication for or against leg specific legislation. Also, another part of lobbying, so that's direct lobbying, uh, grassroots lobbying, and that's when we attempt to influence legislation by encouraging the public to contact legislators about legislation. So IPHA is registered, we're a 501c3, a nonprofit, but several years ago we chose the um, H election with the IRS, which does allow us to do some lobbying. So we can lobby um, and, and, and do that on behalf of Iowa's public health community and our members. Uh, many of you who are on the webinar today are employed at governmental public health and you do have some restrictions about what it is that you can do. You need to essentially know your funding source. That's really the, the key thing for you to know and what those restrictions are. I just want to run through a few quick examples. So, and we'll pinpoint whether it's advocacy or lobbying. So if you were to prepare educational materials that depict success stories from your local health department programs, that's advocacy, that's just education. If you prepare materials that include information on health programs at your local health department and contain messaging for or against specific legislation, that's lobby. Tweeting statistics about diabetes and descriptions of public health interventions that are helping to reduce diabetes, rate, diabetes rates, that's advocacy. Tweeting a message urging Congress to vote against cuts for diabetes prevention programs in local health departments, that's lobbying. Sending weekly e newsletter discussing factual information on opioid abuse and outlining programmatic efforts that are proven to reduce this health issue, that's advocacy. 
emailing a call to action to members of your organization to encourage them to contact their legislator in favor of opioid prevention legislation, that's lobbying. So again, important to know how you're funded and what the constraints are. IPHA does a lot of education about this with our membership. I just recently sent a really great piece that was produced by the Network for Public Health Law. I sent that out to our members that really talks about limitations on lobbying based on federal funding and state funding. And so I encourage, um, if you're a member, take a look at that IPHA in brief that you got and look at those resources. If you're not a member, there's another reason for you to join us, or you can just contact me directly and I'd be happy to send that to you. So who are targets for advocacy? We've talked really closely about elected officials here, but the media is also a target for advocacy. And you saw examples of where our presenters engaged the media in their advocacy, or, or at least responded to the media. Um, your shared partners and the public, all targets for advocacy. So here's the thing, in public health, we are so, so good with data. We are so good at compelling scientific evidence. We are not so great about storytelling. And that is something that the IPHA Advocacy Committee has really been working on. Um, we understand, especially in our current political environment, Representative Bergen uh, made reference to um, libertarians and things that are compelling and not compelling to them. And so we really have to put a face on the issue and understand um, that facts inform, but stories persuade. So here's an example. Um, let's put yourself in the shoes of a legislator and let's pretend um, trying to persuade you to close the loophole in Iowa's Smoke Free Air Act. So I'm sure you're all getting ready to celebrate on July 1st the 10th anniversary of Iowa's Smoke Free Air Act. So I could do this. I could tell you Secondhand smoke exposure causes 46,000 heart disease deaths and 3,400 lung cancer deaths annually among adult non-smokers. Casino workers are at a greater risk for both. Even in a well-ventilated casino, casino workers have codeine, which is metabolized nicotine, levels 300 to 600% higher than in other smoking workplaces during a shift. The average level of cotinine among non-smokers increased by 456%, and the average levels of carcinogen NNAL increased by 112% after four hours of exposure to secondhand smoke in a smoke-filled casino with a sophisticated ventilation system. So there I am being my good public health self and chock full of data to make the case for why we have um, need to go back and close the casino loophole, which does not protect those Iowans who work in that um, setting from secondhand smoke exposure. Or also good in, Iowa, in public health, we're good with maps, we're good with graphs and charts. I can tell you that 63% of Iowans surveyed support extending the statewide smoke-free air act to cover state regulated casinos. Or I can show you a map depicting that most of our neighbors have already seen fit to do this. So maybe that's a little more compelling. Or I can introduce you to Vincent Renich, who worked in Atlantic City casinos for the past 25 years. Vinny was diagnosed with lung cancer. His doctor advised him to quit smoking, but Vinny has never smoked a day in his life. During New Jersey's smoke-free legislative battle in which casinos are the only workplace from the state smoke, exempt from the state smoke-free indoor air law, Vinny spoke up. Casino workers were being left behind as second-class citizens. Vinny was fired by the Tropicana for what he feels was retaliation for speaking up and engaging others in the right to breathe clean air. The good news is that lung surgery was successful and Vinny's now cancer free. Secondhand smoke cost Vinny part of his lung. Speaking up about it cost him his job. The message to lawmakers, let's not let casino workers down. They deserve the same workplace health protections as every other worker. So I share these examples because I think it's helpful to see where we are typically in our comfort space with as public health professionals with the data and the incidence rates and the risk, um, relative risk, and then moving a little bit more to something that's visual and comparing our state to other states, and then moving into this space that might feel a little squishy to some of us, and that's really telling a compelling story um, about how a public health law can protect the health of citizens. And some quick advocacy tips for you. At the basic level, advocacy is about building relationships. And I think you've heard that reiterated several times on today's webinar. The goal is to become a valuable resource for policymakers. No matter who the audience is, you should keep in mind the following tips. Be confident, 
frame your message to answer the question, so what? That's so important. Plan and practice your message. Present a clear and compelling message. Less is more, and I think you heard Representative Bergen say that too. Offer yourself as an expert resource and provide examples from your community. Stories are more compelling than statistics. Our number one job as advocates is to make it easy for decision makers to give us what we want. If you can figure out what might be in it for them to support your issue, that's the best means of persuasion. So we call this power mapping, and these are the kinds of questions that you need to um, do, the, do the research and understand, again, back to relationship building, um, understand what will influence the people who are in a position to make a decision to impact public health policy. Who do they need to hear it from? Maybe you're not the right message bearer. Who, who do they listen to? And um, see how you can engage them. Oops, and let's move quickly into questions and answers. So I am going to unmute all of our presenters now. And we will move to some questions. I know we have a few. Let's just quick check um, audio, Bethany. Yes, Bethany. Good. And Heather? Yep, I'm here. Krista? I'm here. Representative Bergen? I'm here. All right, super. Thanks for hanging in there. Okay, so we do have just a couple questions. Um, one of them was, first of all, a comment from um, a member who said she was excited to hear that um, the work that was done by Sarah Gordo and others, that it helped them meet a standard within public health accreditation. So thanks for sharing that piece, um, Bethany. Um, another question, slides and audio, yes, they will be made available. The recording will go to the IPHA webinar channel, and so that is a resource within the IPHA website um, that you have to be a member to log in to access. And while I'm talking about the webinar channel, I do want to just point this out because, Krista, I think it was in your presentation when you were saying that the Iowa -led General Assembly website can be a little challenging to navigate. It's like landing in a strange land. Um, and we did, IPJ hosted a webinar in December of last year in which then um, IDPH policy liaison, Deborah Thompson, did a really comprehensive review of how to make your way through that website, um, how to use it. There are all sorts of tools that even I, as the registered lobbyist for IPJ, did not know and still want to go back and review pieces of that webinar. So again, that's available to um, IPHA members on our webinar channel. I would strongly recommend um, having a listen to that webinar. Okay, so some other questions here. Um, is it more effective to contact all committee members or just the committee chair? I think that goes to you, Representative. Well, I think, well, by and large, you want to co contact your representative who serves on that committee. Um, if it um, that's that's the best that contact you've established you reinforce it if the committee members uh, from three counties away you might want to contact your ally on a local level to contact that uh, member or the association might want to look at their membership roster and and encourage contact for uh, committee members so send in an email blanket to all the committees who are not on your ballot or do not serve in your area may, may be interpreted as, as stretching into the lobby area. And so that's why I caution on, on that perspective. Uh, but it is the, um, you know, all, each committee member um, votes. If there's a topic on the Ag Committee, I don't serve on that. If I have a constituent contact me about this, uh, maybe it's a vaccination for beef cattle since we're on vaccine. If, if there's a concern, I might mention that to one or two of my colleagues who I know are on the Ag Committee that uh, ask them for help in responding back to my constituent about this concern or getting information on which direction it's going. But the committee members themselves are, are the ones involved with the issue at the time that it's there. Even uh, when, yeah, and I'd add, when, when items come onto the floor, if there's an amendment, that amendment is almost always coming from a, a fellow committee member uh, that has a little in-depth knowledge rather than just uh, another floor, uh, another representative from the floor. Those, those amendments tend to come from within that group of legislators that are on topic. 
So that's some really good inside baseball for Representative Bergen. So taking that last piece about um, amendments coming from within the committee. So if you, so back to your example about um, vaccines for livestock. If you were contacted by a, um, a constituent who said, you know, I have really, I have concern about this issue. I know you're not on the ad committee. Would you feel compelled to then reach out to a colleague who is on the ad committee and say, hey, I'm hearing from constituents about this? Or how? what would you do with that? Sometimes it's a matter of uh, level of concern. And if, if it's a broad range uh, where there's an association that's involved, uh, some group, they can work to the beef producers on this. They're members working to that. Sometimes I'm getting the call just as a, a backup. It's once the committee has dealt with it, it's an awareness level that, you know, that can go on, that there, there's those issues. Um, I would expect as an association that, that at least the bill is going to be in the House and it's not uh, languishing in the Senate, uh, you know, and hasn't even got to us at this point or vice versa, um, that, it, that it is relevant. Um, uh, but we have a lot of demands and for something uh, of, a, you know, particular interest, um, oftentimes, we'll pass uh, one of our constituents off to uh, a colleague and say, can you respond directly to my beef producer because he's got questions, you've got some expertise, you can help uh, inform him on, on, the, on the process. One other caveat that I'd share is that, you know, the bill comes out and then amendments come later, and those amendments can oftentimes make relatively significant changes to the bill. And the public isn't aware of those changes, or even the amendment can be adopted and we're moving on uh, to a, a vote on the whole bill. And, and it's apparent that we're getting information from constituents who don't realize that, that the bill's changed in its, its scope or, or, or focus. Um, and, and that's just the problem of the timing and the communications of, of what we're able to, to do. But associations really help. That's where we work with uh, the lobbyists. Um, and, and why you participate uh, to help clarify those issues uh, and share that information back. Great. True. Yeah. And even when we as the Public Health Association have a bill tracker and we're trying to track, um, it takes a village. Back to that slide, um, it's really helpful to have relationships with other organizations who also have maybe um, greater capacity in the capital with their lobbying firms to um, have those networks of informal communication to say, hey, you know, Janine, did you see there's this amendment? Um, that kind of thing is really helpful. So that's, that's a good tip. Another question here is how do I find out who's on any given committee? And I think we already addressed that just by saying that website is chock full of really good information. Um, and there is a webinar to, to really do a deep dive on how to use the website. But as always, I mean, just don't hesitate to pick up the phone or call or email me and I'm happy to help any of our membership work through that. Um, let's just pause and just say, so I'm done seeing any other unanswered questions. Is there anybody um, among our presenters who you heard something one of your fellow presenters mentioned that you'd like to elaborate on more or maybe some lesson sharing or ideas that you got from hearing one another today? I'm good. Um, I kind of elaborated on to Heather's and uh, I think it's a nice little mix you guys had set up here. So thank you. Thanks, Bethany. Or Krista, I'm sorry. Okay, any, anyone else? I do want to just also point out that on the IPHA website, so if you go to iowapha.org, um, we did, our advocacy committee took the work this year to create a policy position statement on the public health practice of immunizations. IPHA, you know how broad a topic public health is. And so we do, um, even if something's not a priority issue for us on which we're actively working or proactively working, we do from time to time realize there is a need for us to be on the record in some way, shape or form, and that we need to have a one pager ready for use by our members and partners. And so you will find that on the IPHA website. If you go to our advocacy page, um, you'll find a list of policy position statements. And our committee um, meets every summer and every fall. We survey our membership um, just to refresh all those statements with current data, see what we might need to create new statements on. So that's another resource. And those are publicly available. They're not in the member-only part of the website. 
All right. So any parting comments from our presenters or I will wrap us up here. Okay, then I will just say on behalf of the Iowa Public Health Association, I'd like to thank our presenters for sharing their expertise and their experiences with us today. Thank you to all our participants for spending this time and for going over time with us. We hope it has increased your knowledge and skills to be prepared to advocate for evidence-based public health policy. If you have subsequent questions or you want to continue this conversation, please don't hesitate to reach out to IPHA. If you're an IPHA member, a special thank you for your investment in our collective work and mission. If you're not yet an IPHA member, I invite you to consider membership. We need your support in our efforts to focus the network to be proactive on Iowa's public health core issues. As you log off today, you will receive a brief, I promise it's brief, four questions evaluation. We very much appreciate your feedback on today's session and input on future IPHA education offerings. Thank you and have a good afternoon.